Welcome to those who have joined us for this part of uh, today's proceedings. It's lovely to see some of our neighbours here. Welcome to Councillor Andrew Woods. Uh, I know our own ward councillor, James King, uh, will be watching the presentation back afterwards. He sends his apologies because he was due to have lunch with his mum, which I think is very important. Can I ask if you're at the back still chatting, that you come and join us towards the front or take your conversation outside. Sorry to be unwelcoming, um, but we do want a little bit of order for this part of the meeting. And let me open this part of the meeting in prayer. Our Father God, thank you for um, your kindness to us. Thank you for the assurance of life that you've been giving us this morning during our time together. And we thank you now for this wonderful building, for the way that um, it was designed to illustrate your glory and to provide such an appropriate place for the message of the gospel and as a, and, and as a blessing to the whole community of the East End of London. Father, thank you for the sunshine today, which sets this building off at its best. And we pray our Father, that as we hear these proposals, as we dream dreams together, we ask, Father, that you would guide our conversations, especially guide John, our architect, and all of our deliberations to come up with the best and wisest scheme for this building, not just to be restored to its former glory, but also to make the most of the immense potential that it has for the work of the Christian gospel and for the blessing to many, many people uh, across the east end of London, to the praise of your glorious name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'd just like to start by saying one or two things about how we've got to the point that we're at uh, today, and then I'm going to introduce uh, John Bailey, our architect, and he's going to show you the um, emerging plans and aspirations that we have for this wonderful building. Um, the recent history of St Anne's dates really from the mid-1970s. Um, like uh, many parts of the East End of London, it went into decline in the middle years of the 20th century. Uh, the congregation dwindled, the building was falling into disrepair. And in 1976, uh, my predecessor Chris Idle led the congregation of St Matthias Poplar up the road into St Anne's to join um, Rona and a, a faithful few others uh, to mark a new beginning for this building. At that time, Chris counted 200 broken window panes. Uh, there were pigeons flying to and fro inside the building, buckets everywhere to catch drips and sometimes to catch dead pigeons. Apparently the smell was quite special. Um, and I think if it hadn't been a landmark historic uh, Nicholas Hawksmoor building, it might well have been closed. But instead, uh, through the efforts of the congregation and some committed members of the community around here, some of whom are with us um, this morning, uh, the process of restoring the building began. And through the 80s and 90s, um, uh, especially with the help of London Docklands Development Corporation, as well as other grant making bodies, and the energies of uh, some of those here present and those known to us, um, the building began to be restored. The outside has been fully cleaned, restored. Uh, the towel has been underpinned. The, the, um, the, the crypt room um, was created in the early 80s. Uh, before that point, there wasn't any space in the building for Sunday school or, or other kind of parish or community events. When I started as rector uh, seven years ago, 2014, the next thing on the agenda was to put a lift into the building. We have known for years that people can't get into the building. And at that point, we appointed a, a lift architect. And some of you have seen the plans that she came up with. Um, we were hoping and working towards putting a lift into the north porch. Um, but the more we looked into that, the more we realized that it was um, a massive, complicated, and expensive task to put it in that location, partly because there are bodies buried underneath that porch that we would need to take out and we didn't know how many bodies were there. Um, so it was very hard to cost it and to raise funds for it and to plan it. Um, partly because 
it would require either a second lift to take us down to the lower crypt level, or it would require punching a hole in the wall of the tower near its foundations to come through, um, which uh, most people who, who know about these things sort of suck their teeth and said, wow, that's some um, ambitious. Um, so over the past year, we stopped, we took stock, and we decided we wanted to have a fresh look at everything. Um, we advertised and interviewed and appointed a new architect uh, who um, we asked not only to be the architect for the building generally and to inspect it as we have to have done every five years um, for the ongoing maintenance of the building, but also to draw up a new master plan for the building, um, a central part of which is step-free access for all. Uh, to take a fresh look at the plans for the north porch and to look at other locations for that, as well as how to bring the rest of the crypt into use for church and community activity and to complete the restoration of this space uh, and so on. The ambition is to get all of that work done by 2030, which will be the 300th anniversary of the consecration of this building. Um, uh, so earlier on this year, we um, appointed John Bailey uh, as our architect. Uh, John is a senior partner at uh, Thomas Ford and Partners, um, which are a firm of architects that have decades of experience with buildings like this, churches, cathedrals, as well as other buildings. And uh, John's going to take over uh, now and uh, show us the thinking that uh, he's been through in consultation with others and the proposals that are emerging. So, John, over to you. I should say as well, sorry, just as you're coming, I should say welcome to those who are joining us online. This meeting is being Zoomed uh, to those who are joining us online. We will monitor the Zoom feed for any comments that you want to make uh, when we come to questions and discussion in a few minutes time. Uh, and um, uh, it's being recorded as well. So the recording then will be made available for those that couldn't get here today. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, we haven't been involved with you very long, but we've come to really appreciate uh, not only the building, but the people here. And it's great to be at the start of something that could be very exciting. A um, little bit about Thomas Ford and Partners. We have been around since 1926, so we, we've built up a reasonable amount of experience with historic buildings and churches. And some of those churches have been in our care since 1955 when the inspection measure came in place and until seven years ago one of them still had the original incumbent um, but he has now retired. So reason for coming here today is really to explain where we are. Nothing is set in stone yet but what we would like to do is share with you where we have got to and one of the themes I want to get across to you is that change is not to be feared we have to manage change. We're all here for a very short period of time in relation to this building and to other buildings. And what I need to demonstrate to you is that change is the only reason this building is still here. Now we've heard about the original design by one of the greatest classical architects this country has ever produced, Hawksmoor, who was a pupil or an assistant to, to Wren and produces English Baroque. And I won't bore you for the next five hours on what English Baroque is. But the building he produced here is absolutely stunning. Designed around about 1711, they start work in 1714 and through various phases, they finish around about 1724, 25, and they actually consecrate in 1730. But the building that they finished in 1730 was different from the one designed in 1711, 1714, and is very different from the building you have today. Most of you will know that we had a little thing called a fire in the 1850s, and basically everything that you see inside here today is after the 1850s. So that is the pews, the floors, the galleries, the ceiling, the roof, everything is about 120, 130 years after the original building was constructed. So of Hawksmoor's building, we only have the external walls and the tower and the crypt. You've also got to remember that by the 1890s, another very eminent 
architect Arthur Blomfield, or probably his studio by then, reorder the East End. So all the great timber work you see is from his reordering. And then you get into the 20th century and the crypts reordered in various phases, including in the Second World War, when of course many people from the surrounding areas sought shelter here at St Anne's. And we've still got elements of that um, air raid shelter below, some fabulous toilets, but you have to bring your own bucket, I'm afraid. And what I'm trying to get across to you is that the only reason this building has survived is because it has changed. And whether we like it or not, an evolution in the natural world tells us if we don't change and adapt, we die. Now, what I've got to do is pick this very delicate path through keeping what is significant and wonderful and makes St Anne's St Anne's as a building, but also allow the worshipping community and the wider community to use this building. Because what we want this building to be is a powerhouse of worship and faith and mission, but also a place where anybody in the community feels that they can come and they're safe here. Whether they have Christian faith or no faith or another faith, this is where they want to be. This is the heart of the wider community. And that is quite a challenge because there'll be some people who want to see no change because they're frightened of change and they want the historic building in its current form to remain as is. And there are other people who would quite happily knock it all down and start again. So I have to pick that very careful line. Now we've been at this now probably six months and we are a long way through the process. And that process has been to take the vision for St Anne's, which has been prepared by quite a large, a wide range of people, and try and convert that into something that can be seen in the building itself. Now, I think, well, we've been through a whole lot of possible possibilities from option A through to option F so far. And what I propose to do is very quickly scan through A to E and then show you option F. Option F is where we've currently got to, which we think is a good balance between, between keeping as much historic fabric and as much of what makes this building significant, but also allowing the building to move forward into the 21st century and beyond. Now, if the technology works, and let's see, ah, right. It sort of works. I think the, my glamorous assistant there has actually been um, pressing the right buttons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move a little bit towards here and actually go through the options very quickly and then we'll focus on option F. So this was option A. And you've got to remember what I'm being asked to do is get disabled access to all parts of the building, all the floors, I'm being asked to create much better space for community activities, for worship, for community to feel that they can come here, better toilets, better kitchen, and to allow multiple use so that you could have one or two groups working in parts of the building and still use this part for worship. So this is option A, and I'm only going to spend a few minutes, or a few seconds really. So if we start with the crypt, in order to get my access into the building, I'm suggesting there are two ways. You come in under the steps and you can approach through what is the western part of the crypt, which means removing the blast wall that's still there from the Second World War, coming into the crypt, removing what's left of burial vaults, various walls, the boiler room, and various accretions that are still in about two thirds of the crypt, and creating two open spaces. They are served by a central kitchen, central toilets, and then to get disabled access, we're looking at external lift and staircase on the south side, and cutting a number of holes in the external wall to be able to get people to come up and down. Come to the main floor that you're on and creating creche and meeting facilities at the west end 
And then you can see again the lift coming up. I'm not going to dwell very long on this option because there are a number of fundamental flaws in it. Primarily, the disruption to the historic fabric. And that, of course, is adding anything on the south side because a lot of people will be very upset and I'm cutting three holes in the external wall and people will not think that is acceptable. So we move on very quickly from option A to option B. There we are. Very similar, still having access through from the west, but this time only having access as a small door in the south side, but still generally having the same sort of arrangement internally. To get then the access from crypt level to this level and potentially to gallery level, having a lift and staircase on the north side, basically in the central bay, and that will allow us to have complete vertical circulation. So you can enter if you're in a wheelchair in the crypt and have access to both the crypt, this floor, and potentially the gallery as well. That all works, but again, there was a lot of thought about splitting the basement, or sorry, the crypt, into two parts with this central access corridor. It was not thought that worked very well, it removed flexibility in the crypt, and therefore we rejected option B. We moved to option C. Option C is slightly different. Option C assumes that if we start at the crypt level, everybody, including wheelchair users, enters through the west, underneath the steps that you've got at the west end. You come in at that level, you then have staircases and lifts that take you either the extra about that much to get to the crypt level or take you to the main floor here and then up into the gallery. The advantage of this option is that you have most of the crypt as a single space, only a small doorway on the south side to give us access. And again, at the main worship space, we have the creche and the meeting room on the west end under the galleries. It was thought that this didn't work because it means creating a lift and a staircase that are actually in the body of the church. And they were thought to be very disruptive visually and not acceptable because I'm cutting two holes through the vaults below and that is removing more of Hawksmoor's original fabric than is necessary. So in fact, option C was confined to the dustbin. Option D, we're almost getting to F, is very similar. But again, in order for this to work, we're creating a major extension on the south side. This has the meeting rooms, the kitchens, the staircase, the lift, and it very quickly came apparent that this was never going to be acceptable. A major extension on the outside of a Hawksmoor building, or in fact any church when there are other alternatives, is just not going to wash with Historic England, with the Georgian Group, with the Victorian Society, with the Church Building Council and everybody else we've got to consult, let alone the Diocesan Advisory Committee. So we just rejected that straight out of hand and moved on to E. One more failure and then we'll get to F and we'll talk about F. E is starting to go the right way. So we're again coming in through the west. We've got two staircase, I've got a staircase and a lift under the gallery. We've got a better arrangement in the crypt with toilets, kitchen and so on. But again, there's one fundamental flaw. While the small lift and staircase are further west, they're actually coming up underneath the organ and I'm not going to move the organ. It's, you know, the organ just happens to be in the wrong place. But there you are, it's going to stay there. So in fact, we rejected E and we moved straight on to F. And in fact, if we go, we remove, can we go on to the next one, sorry? Because these are the three floors, but we got the floors now at a bigger scale. And we can actually go through in a degree of detail where we are. So, if you are coming 
here to St Anne's and you want to come to the crypt or you are in a wheelchair, you would enter either by the west, so you can come in underneath the staircases through what is a fabulous space. If ever, any of you have ever made it that far, it's got a lot of bits and pieces stored in it and it's got this big wall going through, a blast wall. So if you made it into the crypt in the Second World War, the blast wall was there to protect you from a blast from outside. It's a brick wall. We're proposing to remove that so you have a wonderful space, very similar to the space you have under the tower as you enter at this level, except it's got a lovely dome on it. You can then come through past the two Second World War first aid posts. They're in green. The burial chambers are going to remain where they are. We are not proposing to remove the vast numbers of bodies that are in both of those, countless numbers. And then you can descend by the restored steps into the crypt. Now, originally, Hawksmoor's crypt has these evenly spaced columns. Those two were added in the 1850s to support the organ. So they're additions. Once you're now in the crypt, you have a full run of the entire crypt. Currently, your crypt room ends there. You've only got that much. So in fact, we are more than doubling the space that is available as an open space that can be subdivided. So you can have multiple use in that crypt and they will have their own toilets and their own tea and refreshment facilities. If you are a wheelchair user or want to have an alternative route in, you come through one doorway on the south side. So all we're proposing, we leave the window alone and we just lower the window sill so you can drive straight in at the level of the floor of the crypt. So all I'm removing is about two square meters, well, I suppose we should use yards nowadays, two square yards of masonry. At that point, you can either come into the crypt or you can go into the staircase and the lift that will take you to this floor and potentially to the gallery space. You have a substantial kitchen, you have toilets, and as you notice, the toilets are in two blocks, but actually can be divided into three. So when you've got the homeless shelter running in the crypt, you can have male and female, and you can divide this space into two, so it's multiple use, and it's meeting all the safeguarding and all the other um, procedures that you have to have. You can have the whole space as one space. We can divide it into two. We can divide it into three. And the great idea or hope is that the crypt will be this space where you can have worship, you can have children's activities. You, you saw the Sunday school going out today. Would it be great instead of one group going up into the, the gods, another one going down into the crypt and whatever, they could all go into the crypt and be able to do what they would like to do. You have a number of other initiatives with children and young people and you're so short a space, you could have the entire crypt. To give you an idea of the space, it is everything within the central body of the nave here, plus two bays that way and two bays that way. That is the space you have downstairs. And it's an enormous space with all the kitchens and the toilets and everything else scattered around. So this works extremely well. We retain the Hawksmoor lobbies and staircases at the East End, so they're all retained. So in this option, all I am doing is cutting one little hole there and I am removing what is left of the late 19th century burial vaults that are within that part of the crypt. If we move on then to this floor, this floor, we are proposing that the remaining pews, which date from the restoration after the fire in the 1850s and were then altered later, are removed and you have a level floor throughout. If we can get underfloor heating in it, we will try. And that means you will have basically most of this space open for worship, for secular activities, for your children's work, when you have workshops, when they're here for a week or more, this entire space 
is available to you. So it's really quite a fantastic arrangement. All the galleries stay, all the pillars stay, the organ stays, all this stays, all that stays. We're only removing what's left of the pews, which are not original to the building. What we are creating is the creche and a little tea point. So if you see the big white pillar there, and then there's the big further pillar behind, we are just enclosing that space in the back. Most people will not even notice that we've done it. And we're doing the same on the other side, and that is where the staircase and the lift punch up through the floor. And that is the second significant alteration to the Hawksmoor work in that I've got to cut a hole in a vault to get that vertical circulation. There's nothing I can do about that. Not everybody will think that's acceptable. I think that's an acceptable compromise to give this building the sustainable longer term use that it fundamentally needs. All buildings have to change. And so what we believe we're doing is the minimum amount of change necessary to give this building a new lease of life. And if we can get the storage right and everything else right, we can remove all the stored items in the south porch with the wonderful, probably Hawksmoor timber staircase. And then we can reorder the later staircase. That's a Victorian staircase put in after the fire of, eight, of the 1850s. And there's a, this lovely little sort of cupboard, probably a, a little office where people could ride shotgun over people coming in and out. Well, that can be confirmed, converted into a single fully accessible toilet. So anybody who really does need a toilet doesn't have to go all the way down into the crypt. They can just go out and use a toilet at this level. So again, giving us this wonderful flexibility and greater use for the building. The pulpit and the font will be relocated and used in the building. None of that gets removed, none of that gets thrown away. And if we very quickly move on, not a lot to show at this level other than there is the possibility of taking the lift up to gallery level. So it's just a tube about 1.2, 1.3 meters wide that would just come up through the floor of the gallery. So in fact, you have got disabled access to gallery level as well, if you require it. For the rest of us, We've got two fabulous staircases, so we will use those fabulous staircases. We don't need another staircase within the body of the church. And of course, we've got staircases there, and we've got staircases here as well. So we're not short of those. So if I didn't very quickly move on, so what's this going to look like? Well, here you are. Here's two examples. That is St. Martin's in the field in London. I'm sure many of you have been to it. I actually passed it yesterday. It's a, it's a little bit younger than your church. We're talking about the, the 1730s. It's a fabulous space. It gives them so much flexible space. They can do so much with the wider community. We all know what St. Martin the Field does. This would be something that you could also do here, utilizing this space. And you've got to remember when this building was designed, it was envisaged that that crypt would have been open. It wasn't to be subdivided or filled. And here's one that we've just completed. This is St. George's Church, Hanover Square. Um, very similar. Again, a little bit later than you. We're talking about the 1730s. Without that space, these buildings would not be able to do what they do today. Particularly here at St. George's, Hanover Square, it's been two phases of clearing the crypt and then providing new access. They've got new vertical lift access there. They are doing so much work with Alcoholics Anonymous, with the homeless, with those who have debt problems, those who just want somewhere to sit. It'd be fabulous to be able to run a cafe on a daily basis instead of going to Costa. Apologies if anybody works to Costa, by the way. But why not come here, charge them a pound rather than £2.50, and if they want to sit here for half a day, they can sit here for half a day. We're not going to judge them. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And people, I've been here early mornings, and the number of people who walk through the churchyard and then walk back, well, wouldn't it be great if we way, waylaid them? And if they felt they could come here, think of the mission and opportunities in the future that, you know, oh, by the way, did you know? It's a fantastic opportunity for us. And if we just move quickly to the last one, 
All those were worried about what a lift and staircase might look like. Well, there you are. That is one at St. Saviour's Christchurch, Knightsbridge. That's what you're looking at. Something that is fantastically well-designed and modern and exciting. This little accent within what is a fantastic building, which you've got to remember when it was constructed and consecrated in 1730, was cutting edge design. There was nothing else like it. And so what we're doing is we're acknowledging that there has been this wonderful building, and now we see it as a wonderful historic building, but it has to move on. And if we're going to do it, we're going to do it properly, not in a little apology stuck in a corner. We're going to make a positive contribution. So in another hundred years time, when there's another congregation here, they're going to say, didn't they do that well? Wasn't it fantastic? But it's now time to move on because the world has moved on. There may be, of course, a 21st century preservation society who will want to keep the lift and the staircase, but that's not going to be our problem. Well, one or two of you might be young enough, but it won't be mine. And so what I'm trying to say is that while this is not the definitive way forward, this is where we've got to, and there is strong reasons why we would like to do it. So if we'd like to go, if we go back to, I think, the crypt floor level, if we go back to the crypt level, which I think is about four back, one more, that's it. I will shut up. I will pass on to the boss and um, we can take matters further. Yeah, super. So um, <clears throat> John is now mic'd up independently and we've got the chance now to ask uh, any questions of John or state our own comments on what you've seen and so on. As you're just thinking about that, let me mention two things. Um, if you're shy to speak publicly um, just at the moment, there are some cards, some little slips on the shelf on the back of the pews um, where you can just jot down your comments um, or questions um, at the end um, as you leave. And especially there's a question on there which says, how can you help make this a reality? So if you um, feel you've got something to offer, then leave your contact details as well. Um, James, I gave your apologies earlier, um, but you're here. <laughs> so uh, our councillor, James King, will you send our apologies to your mum uh, that you're not with her and you're with us instead? Um, so questions or comments, I will bring the microphone to you if there's anything you want to ask. Right, yeah, yeah. Kenny first. Thank you. Um, the plans look fabulous. I think they've been done really sensitively. Um, I had a question around archiving. Are you going to be capturing what the church building looks like now and then capturing the change that it goes through? Um, two, um, will there be an office for church staff in the building? I didn't see that on the plans. And three, um, spiral staircases are quite tricky for someone like me who is a prosthesis wearer. Yeah. Is that the only option in terms of stairs that you are able to put in that combines stairs and lift? Right, there were, there were three questions there. First was an archival one. Yes, the building is in fact being photographed. The crypts are being photographed by English Heritage, actually. They, they wish to record them. Um, we will record everything before we start. And I should have noted that part of this overall plan is the full conservation and restoration of the current damage that the building has. So the holes in the plaster ceiling where it's badly damaged, the windows, the fantastic clutterbuck eastern window will be fully conserved, restored. I don't like the word restore, conserved and repaired. So all that will be part of what we do. The second one was a parish office. Yes, one of those spaces at this level, one of those two spaces is going to double up as the parish office. So on a Sunday, it's a, it's a crash but during the rest of the week, it is a parish office. So we're trying to multitask. We will have lots of different spaces, which is not justifiable. We will have one space that you will have to share. So that means you'll have to put everything away tidily on a Friday or a Saturday before the children get to it. The last one was the spiral staircase. Now, it's a space thing. I can give you a square dogleg staircase with a square lift. One, it doesn't look as nice, but then you can tell me I'm an idiot because it's not so easy for you to use. 
but I have got the lift. So what we need to compromise between the amount of space and what it's going to look like. So and I apologize if it's going to be difficult for you to use the spiral staircase, but the lift is going to be there for you to use. So we're trying to be as inclusive as I can with the space I've got. I'm trying to keep it so that you've got to remember that I am pretty sure there will be one or two of our secular partners we have to seek sort of we have to consult with will be moaning bitterly I'm cutting any hole in a vault so I'm trying to keep it as small as possible so I apologize if it's going to inconvenience you slightly but I hope the lift will compensate for you thank you this is really trivial I just wanted to know what the green bits are <laughs> the green bits so top right top right storage Storage, 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 two lots of storage and a store under the staircase. I was told in no uncertain terms, I had to have lots of storage. We're not gonna say who insisted on that, but she's sitting just over there. <laughs> in fact, you've got four times as much storage as you currently got. Now I do have to put a boiler somewhere, but we're thinking on the heating are trying to be as environmentally friendly as possible. So we're looking at ground source heating. We then, if we need some backup heat, it might be an electric boiler. We can run off an economy tariff, potentially um, solar collection on the roofs, but we've got to think of the visual impact, but that's something we can discuss. I mean, it'd be really nice if we can run this at carbon neutral and in fact generate power to go back into the grid so that is one of the fundamental things we're trying to do i cannot give you a building that is insulated to the standards that we'd expect under the current building regulations i just cannot do it and i wouldn't do it because of the damage it would do to historic building so if i can run you at carbon neutral then at least we're doing our bit super Ruth is next on a um, similar point in relation to the crypt, it's fantastic to see such a flexible space. How would that space be divided when it was being used by separate people? Yeah. Yes, the idea is that if we, there are a number of foldable screen partition systems. Now, of course, they're not easy to get it to work with square columns and then a vaulted ceiling but they do exist they are expensive but they do exist so one of the things might have to be that in fact you can have the whole space open but in the arches we may have to have a glazed partition that's there more or less permanently and we can open the doors underneath we're at feasibility stage concept stage if the principles are agreed and everybody's happy we can then start to drill into the detail but I'm not drilling into the detail absolutely yet because I haven't got everybody to sign up to the principles. Michael. Thanks, Richard. Uh, John, uh, you mentioned the footfall of people walking through the churchyard. There's an even greater footfall to the north of the church going along the pavement. I just wonder, did you think about opening up a second set of doors um, on the other on the side of the church. Side. Yeah. We had a long discussion about whether we wanted a, the second entrance on the north or on the south. And what we've come up with is a compromise. If we open up both entrances under the western staircase, of course, one of those does face sort of north. And what we want to do is look at the whole way the churchyard works through signage and encouraging people to come through the churchyard. So we can encourage them. I mean, most of us, you know, are able-bodied and can come in under the staircase. The reason for having the extra opening on the south side is it then opens into the part of the churchyard that's already, shall we say, fenced off. So if you've got children's work, you can lead directly to the outside and it is safe and secure and you can control what's going on. And so that is why we decided to have an entrance on the south. We can certainly look at having another entrance on the north. That's not a problem. All I will say is the more holes I cut in the walls, the more people I'm going to upset. But it's down to how we're going to use the building. And it's the balance of significance of the, of the fabric and the need of the parish. So we can prove the need. I'm quite happy to fight it. More comments and questions? 
Oh, and we, have, we have another one from. Yeah, a, thank. Sorry, I don't know your name. Can I go to a couple of other people first? And um, anyone who's following on Zoom, do put questions in the chat if you'd like to. Um, Lawrence uh, shared something with me earlier, and I asked him to share it with the rest of us. Three weeks ago, I had a bit. I was coming into church. It was a Sunday morning. Got to the end of the handrail, and I have to use my stick, and had a bit of an episode. And Big John dragged me into the church, basically. And then after that, Richard invited me to lay the wreath on Remembrance Day. I looked at the monument. This has got nothing to do with the body of the church and decided it was too dangerous to go up and down because basically I would have to walk up the middle. Okay. After that, I just thought, you know, is it worth me continuing to come to St. Anne's? Because basically, it was, you know, I suffer from thin bones. Mm. I fall down those stairs. I'd be lucky to get away with one broken bone. Mm. No, you've made a very important point, and we want to be as inclusive as possible for everybody, because this building should be available to as many people as we can get in, you know, and I'm sorry to hear that you've got your problems. We put lifts in at St Paul's Deptford. Now, you don't know if you know St Paul's Deptford, the great Archer Church, it's about 30 or 40 years younger than, than you are here. But it has this great big piano nobile, which is a huge sort of expanse of paving at this level with lots of staircases. So we're actually able to, we were able to punch a hole through the outside wall and come up on the outside so we could get a lift in. You haven't got that arrangement here, so we have to think a bit more creatively. But you're absolutely right that we want everybody to be able to come here. And it's also parents with young children, with buggies, you know, my three are now 26, 24 and 22. They don't need be brought in buggies but the the hassle of you know it people just are put off so if we make it as an inviting and as easy as possible we're hoping more people want to come here and not just come into the crypt but come to this level get them to this level architecturally having the building on this great piano nobile is fantastic but it does rather say unless somebody's going to carry you up the stairs please don't come in and in the 21st century that's not acceptable there is a revenue implication for the disabled, lack of disabled access. 2020, my parents had their 60th wedding anniversary. We went to four venues before we found one that basically I could get into, and I wasn't the only disabled person going. Yeah. How many weddings don't happen here because some bride's old auntie can't get in? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And this is where the world has changed. You've got to remember, this is not just a building built for the glory of God, but when it was built, it's built as an expression of British power as well. You know, this is a major statement that, you know, Britain is the world's superpower and, you know, this is in an English Baroque. Well, that's all well and good. But what we want now is everybody to feel they can come here and get in. So you're absolutely right. And I hope you'll use the, be the first person to use the lift. Second person, Rona is going to be the first right. to use the lift. <laughs> James King. Thanks. I'll be the third person because I had to carry the pram up the stairs, but I, I might be a bit older by the time the, uh, it comes to fruition. That will, yeah, that was my question, really. Uh, so you said 2030 was the time you wanted this yes. to be done by. Uh, to what extent is that dependent on fundraising efforts? Can, it be, can we do it any quicker, basically? We can do it. I, we could get it all done in 18 months to two years if somebody wrote a very large check today and I can get permission. Now, the, the difficulty, you've got to remember that the process we've got to go through from a permission point of view is this is feasibility. We will then have consultation with the Darton Advisory Committee, the Planning Authority, Historic England, the Georgian Group, the Victorian Society, the Council of British Archaeology, the Church Building Council and probably the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings may well wade in as well because this was designed before the end of the death of Queen Anne. So they will feel that they've got a thing. You've got to remember that not all those groups are interested in how we get this building used more. They're interested in keeping what currently exists because they see historic fabric as a finite resource. And if we remove it, we're denuding the significance of the building. Now, I've got to hold my hand up. I'm a former chairman of the Society of Protection of Ancient Buildings, and so I do fight for historic fabric, but the need is so overwhelming that there has to be change. And it's not that long ago that this 
building could have been demolished or substantially altered to form flats or something else. It's not that long ago. And put it crudely, unless we have a financially viable future for this building, in other words, not just the congregation, but the wider community contributing to its survival, it hasn't got a long-term survival. You know, it may outlive me, but not all the youngsters that are here, it will outlive them unless we give it that chance. So that's my issue, is getting the permissions and then finding the money. And I think, Richard, you're going to talk about money. Yeah, I think that's you? a good time. I'm aware others may have questions and comments, but I think that's probably a good time to just say something. Um, Andrew, was that a question? It was a smile, that's fine. I'm happy to be smiled at, thank you. Um, I don't wanna deprive anyone of the chance to ask a question publicly, um, but just to say what the next steps are. Last Monday, um, Paul and uh, Arthur, our treasurer, and uh, Helen Kenny, who can't be here today, and I um, were interviewing fundraisers because clearly the next step is to start working on plans of where we're going to find uh, the money for this. John refuses at this point to tell us how much it's going to cost uh, because, Big but, because it all needs to be specified in more detail and costed properly and before we start throwing sums around. But I think it's fair to say it's going to be in the millions. Um, so clearly far beyond the resources of our own congregation, unless anyone is harboring secret billions um, that they haven't let me know about so far. So please pray. Um, we, uh, Paul led our prayers earlier on this morning and mentioned uh, Catherine Jackson, who is the fundraiser who we hope to be working with over the next few years. Um, and uh, the plan is to spend the next two or three months for Catherine to put together a feasibility study uh, on our funding. So it will be a case um, for, for funding, case for support. Um, what is our story? What are we going to go and say to our potential supporters? We'll be looking at all the contacts that we have as a church and in the community uh, so far. Do we know people who are trustees of grant making bodies? Do we know people who know high net worth individuals who might give personal donations um, uh, towards supporting it and so on? And once we've got that feasibility study early in the new year, um, that will give us an idea of how confident we can be that we will be able to find the funding we need. Assuming that goes well, um, Catherine will then be helping us to put together our brochure and to start approaching private individuals and grant making bodies. And a lot of the fundraising for the next little while, you won't see much happening on the surface. Um, because we're not going to start holding bake sales and, and, and that sort of thing to raise kind of 50 P's and 20 pounds and uh, 200 pounds at a time. We're going to be going for the big money first. Once we've got, God willing, some substantial donations and grants, then there'll be a public phase when we'll be saying, look, we've got this much. Now we need people to contribute to get that much more. And uh, as John has said, the hope and prayer is that we get all the funds that we need over the next few years. We may be able to do the work in phases. We've asked John to look at, if we go with this um, uh, master plan, whether we can possibly get the lift in before some of the other work is done and so on. Um, but that's what we'll be working at over the next um, few months and so on. I think I'm going to stop there. Can we thank John again very much for coming out here on Sunday and making this presentation? That's been really helpful, John. Thank you very much. I have to say, um, I've been connected with this building for about 20 years. I've been the rector for seven years. At times, it's felt like we've been wading through treacle. At times, we felt like we've been going around in circles. But I think over the last few months, um, I, for the first time, it felt like we're lined up and we know where we're going and we're on the right track. So I'm personally really encouraged and I hope you are as well by today's presentation. Do feed in comments and thoughts that haven't been shared. Feed, fill in those little cards, drop an email. I want to take the opportunity to thank publicly as well um, those who labour behind the scenes, um, both as members of the congregation and 
um, those who are involved in our sister charity, Care for St Anne's, which Chris Idle, um, uh, my predecessor, got set up in the early 80s, particularly Michael Hebert, uh, who is standing down um, at the AGM in a few minutes' time as chairman of Care for St Anne's, chairman of the Trust, but staying on, God willing, as our secretary for the time being. Um, but Michael has been a local resident here for years and has been involved through the um, 80s, 90s, and um, more recently. Uh, but there are a number of other people who uh, you may not know or see, other members of the management committee of Care for St Anne's and so on, who devote an awful lot of time and energy behind the scenes. Um, so thank you all very much. Can we give them a round of applause, please? And um, in just a moment, I'm going to ask Gabriel Ezema, who's one of our church wardens and has just joined the management committee of Care for St Anne's to close in prayer. Uh, then we'll have a few minutes for people to um, uh, leave if they want to and need to, and then we'll uh, have a very brief AGM of Care for St Anne's. Uh, so those that are staying for that, please uh, feel free, but it will just be a brief business meeting uh, in a few minutes' time. But over to you, Gabriel, to close this part of our public meeting in prayer. Father, I thank you for, uh, for today's service. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for everyone that is available here. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the presentation um, John made. Father, Lord God, we thank you, for we know that you are very much in what we are doing and the renovation that is taking place here, because you attract much more souls and made it available for people to worship you. Father, we pray most especially, Lord Jesus, for the fund the money we need to carry out this project. It's a great project, it's a big project, but there's nothing impossible before you as Lord and Savior. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do. I believe, and we believe as a church, Lord, that the money we need will come easily to the glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, as we live, Lord, lead us home safely. In the mighty name of Jesus, as we are about to do a journey meeting, Father, Lord God, we pray that you be with us. Guide us through every agenda and direct us in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks, Gabriel, and thanks very much to everyone for coming. <laughs>